Hello, and here we are again for another one of our online services here at Park Baptist Church. I realised this week that we're coming up to six months of doing church in this manner. And it's not been an easy ride for many of you, I know. So thank you for those that have been persevering with us through that time. And welcome to those who may be joining us for the first or second time and have used this as an opportunity to maybe just dip your feet in the waters of what church is a bit like, uh, maybe to explore a little bit about who God is and why you might want to spend some time uh, getting to know God and, and putting out those big questions about life uh, that only really uh, we can find satisfactory answers uh, through God. I'm uh, Peter, I'm one of the ministers here at Park Baptist Church and we're going to be spending some time today on a new series looking at the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. Now if you've never read Ruth, if you've never heard of the book of Ruth, it's a really a simple and fairly short story to read. You'll find it uh, fairly early on in the Old Testament, so if you've got a Bible or you're looking up it uh, on your app or online, um, it comes fairly early on and after Judges and before uh, uh, 1 and 2 Samuel, you'll find just uh, uh, stuck in there, just four chapters, is the book of Ruth. And it's a brilliant, rich book uh, to spend a few weeks going through. So over the next four Sundays, we're going to be looking one chapter at a time, chapters 1, 2, 3 and 4, uh, through the book of Ruth. So I encourage you to read along with me during the week. Um, I encourage you to um, just spend some time familiarising yourselves with the story, with the characters, with the themes that are going on. It's, it's really quite straightforward to read. Um, or, or if you're not confident reading, then um, listen to it. Use uh, an audio Bible uh, and have it read to you. And just allow that, uh, yourself to be familiarised with that story if you're not already. And that's going to be the focus uh, of our, our next few weeks. Now one of the, um, the themes uh, of Ruth is... Um, is a word that comes up a few times. It's a Hebrew word, word that we, we wouldn't really be familiar with in English, um, called kised. And this is a word that's used throughout the Old Testament. And it's got a, a kind of a number of different translations when you look it up. You won't find kised in your um, English translations. You, you might find it as kindness, uh, loving kindness, uh, mercy, compassion, love. Uh, a few different words are used when this, this Hebrew word is, is, is found in the text are used to be interpreted into our English Bibles. And it's kind of a word that, that speaks of, of, of surprising generosity and a love that, that, that goes beyond anything that we may have experienced before in our lives. And in the book of Ruth, it's two, uh, it's characteristics, uh, it's the characteristics, sorry, of, of Ruth, the main character, and uh, another character, Boaz. But more importantly, it points us towards one of the key characteristics of God, of God who has this, this unexpected generosity, of a love that is incomparable to anything else we may have experienced. And we see this in the Psalms in particular. This is a word that we find and it's used um, um, to, to try and explain God's love, the depth of God's love for all of humanity. We find it uh, Psalm 136. Uh, you might not um, um, recognise it just from me saying the number, but you might recognise particularly the, the refrain that's used here repeatedly uh, throughout this psalm. Um, it's the, the, the refrain, his love endures forever. And we have that, it features in songs, it, it features it sometimes in prayers, it features uh, in the psalms. And Psalm 136 has a load of statements, uh, 25, 26 of them, and then each one is followed with the words, his love endures forever. Uh, the Hebrew, his kised endures forever. And it's trying to, to, to help us to understand the depth and range of God's love. Uh, there's things like, um, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. Um, to him alone who does great wonders, his love endures forever. Um, uh, who spread out the earth upon the waters, who made the great lights, the sun to govern the day, the moon and stars to govern the night. All these things are followed with his love endures forever. As we say these psalms, these statements, as we sing words, songs that pick up um, 
uh, on, on psalms like this and, and others, we are invited to respond to God's love, to try and comprehend just a small part of it. And we worship God in order to, to sort of draw closer to him and to give praise to God because we, we, we start to recognise just this depth of love that God has for us. And we see that um, in its greatest example in the person of Jesus, in Jesus' life, in his death, uh, his sacrificial death and resurrection. Which is why we often speak and sing of, of, of uh, God's love for us and our response to it. And so we're going to spend some time worshipping now, singing some songs. And as we do, um, I invite you just to take that step forward of, of, uh, of moving towards God by, by joining in with these songs. Recognising God's love, giving thanks to God for it, uh, praising God for it. And the amazing thing when we worship God is that we take a very small step, a uh, small step, uh, towards God uh, by, by, by doing that but God always takes a much bigger step towards us God responds to our worship and, and the amazing thing is God uh, in our little small steps God comes and he gathers us in towards himself so we're going to worship God and I invite you to take that small step of worshipping God of recognising God today and as you do allow yourself to be gathered closer to God as God responds to our worship. So we're going to sing a couple of songs and I'm going to say a short prayer now. I invite you to join me in saying that and then we'll worship God together. So let's pray. Creator God, eternal God, loving God, we are here today to meet with you and to worship you. And we thank you that your love endures forever. And so as we take a small step towards you in our worship now, we ask that you would come and gather us in together, draw us close to you, Lord, that we might experience and encounter the depth of your love in a new and powerful way that we might be reminded of how generous your love is for us and so we worship you now Lord Amen Above all things, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. A mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise. God. 
sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever you are faithful, forever you are strong, forever you are with us. I encourage you now to respond by finding uh, reasons to give thanks to God in prayer. And so in a second, um, I invite you just to press the pause button and to spend a few moments thinking about uh, things that you can give thanks to God for. Maybe look back over this past week. Maybe there's been answers to prayer that you can recognise and, and say, thank you, Lord, for uh, answering that prayer that I had. Maybe you've had um, a really uh, a nice time with the family or you've had an enjoyable walk in the countryside or, or, or maybe uh, you simply are thankful that, that you're in good health or that you've, uh, you've got a job or whatever it might be. I encourage you to spend some time just thinking and reflecting and giving thanks to God for the goodness that he brings into our lives. And if you've had a really rubbish week or maybe you're going through a really tough time at the moment I encourage you to still do this exercise don't gloss over it because actually I think when we go through those really rough times more than ever it's important that we're able uh, to still uh, give thanks to God to praise God and if we can't think of something uh, um, uh, from the past week or past couple of weeks then just pause uh, and think and take stock and say actually well Maybe I can simply give thanks for God for who God is rather than for my own current circumstances because I know that although life is bad for me and I'm really struggling at the moment and Lord, um, I want you to hear and see this because I am struggling and, and, and here's the problems I have in my life. I also recognise that you're still good because you're God and that my circumstances don't change the fact that God is still good, that God is still worthy of me taking some time out of my day and thanking him. And so if, you, if you're in that, that position, if that's you, that you're in that boat, then don't gloss over this. I, I really urge you to, to press pause as well and to spend some time thinking and uh, taking all of that to God in prayer. So we're going to do that and then um, we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer together. And so whenever you're ready to uh, unpause it, I'll lead us and invite you to join in as well at home as we say the Lord's Prayer. So press pause and we'll do that together. So let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Before we move on to our reading, I have just a short couple of notices, um, which are really, I guess, for um, the regulars at Park Baptist, those that are living in and around the Great Yarmouth area as well. Uh, firstly, for church members, we've got a special church meeting coming up on the 16th of September. And 
that is to approve the CIO governing uh, constitution, uh, which uh, we're going through the process. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry. But if you're a church member, you should definitely know what I'm talking about. And so we're going to need uh, every church member that we can uh, to access. It's going to be on Zoom. It's going to be a really short church meeting, um, assuming no one um, tries to throw any uh, unexpected grenades into the uh, the meeting. Um, and it's just to approve the document that we've already gone through as a church way back earlier in the year. And uh, this is a, just, just a sort of a formal process that says that we've agreed this at a special church meeting uh, to proceed uh, with registering. So uh, you should have had an email if you're a church member from Denise with uh, the copy of the draft constitution and with uh, a, a document to go alongside that. And if you can't make it on Zoom, uh, the solicitors who are doing all this work, uh, getting us to register as a CIO, have advised us that if there's any members that can't make uh, that church meeting on Zoom, then uh, they, they simply uh, fill in uh, this form that Denise has sent and uh, return it to her uh, via the church. And that just says, yes, even though I can't be there, I do approve of it. Uh, of this process that the church are taking. Um, it doesn't count. It's not a technically a postal vote for those of you that are, are really into your church constitution and know the rules. Um, but, but it's just to say, uh, it's just so that we've got proof that even for those that couldn't access um, Zoom and, uh, and the internet, uh, that, that we still had um, uh, more than uh, enough people across the whole church uh, who were in support of, of this uh, transition uh, to becoming a registered charity uh, as a CIO. So uh, any questions, just drop me an email or a call or Denise as well. And if um, if you know people that uh, aren't uh, uh, on the internet, uh, they're going to be getting paper copies of all this as well. Uh, so don't worry uh, if, you, uh, if you're if you thinking of church members that, that don't have access to the internet. Uh, if you, you know any church members that don't have access, but maybe you could help them by accessing it uh, for, for one or for a few minutes, then then by all means get in touch with them um, and, and see if we can organise that. So as many people as possible can be present for that uh, short meeting. I'm talking five, ten minutes max um, on the 16th of uh, September. The login details will be just as usual for uh, our uh, coffee mornings and, and uh, prayer meetings, so exactly the same login details for that. So uh, that's a church uh, meeting, special church meeting coming up, and uh, we've got our um, connect groups is the other thing I need to plug to you. I'm just trying to find my notes down here. Uh, our connect groups are really um, our key expression of what it means to be church during this time. They are our midweek groups, they're meeting in people's gardens, um, some are meeting outside the church in the little, uh, little parking area we've got outside the church, and they're taking place on different days, different times, and they're in uh, a socially distanced, um, organised way, there's uh, caps on how many people are in each group, so it's all being done with government guidelines in mind and as safely as possible. This, I just really want to plug and encourage you, if you've not been part of a connect group or you're sort of seeing it as a bit, oh, I can't be bothered. If you're a church member, you're regular at Park, this is church. And I can't emphasise that enough. This is what it means to be church family at this time and to support one another, to continue to grow. Uh, it concerns me that, that for some of us, perhaps we're lapsing into, I'm just going to stick on YouTube at some point on a Sunday, maybe a Monday, maybe a Tuesday uh, or later in the week. And that's my hit done. And that's not, that's not what this is about. And, you know, to, to, to be grown in our faith during this time, to be uh, uh, um, uh, continuing to go deeper with the Lord as disciples of Jesus, it means that we need to be together. It means that we need to do more than simply watch this on YouTube. And uh, that starts with the body of Christ. Uh, and at the moment, our connect groups are that expression. So, um, you know, as people's lives start getting a bit busier again, as things open up and you start kind of your, your diaries filling up again, Please don't overlook the importance of connect groups. Um, they're, they're a brilliant opportunity um, to go deeper with the Lord, to get support, prayer support, pastoral support, and to know that there's others uh, around uh, who, who are walking and journeying with us. Uh, even though we can't see everyone on a Sunday together at the moment, we're still able to see a few members of that church family. Uh, so if you're not part of one, please uh, uh, get in touch with me. Let me know, reach out, because we are finding space. We've got... Uh, uh, spaces in a couple of groups at the moment and if we need more I'll start more groups that's not a problem so please do I can't emphasize that enough get involved with that connect groups um, if you're not already part of one 
Uh, final thing uh, in terms of notices is, uh, is is a bit of a tricky one. Well, it's not a tricky one, really. Uh, it's just a bit of a delicate one, and it's to do with church finances. It's to do with giving. Um, I don't think over the last six months, if you've been watching all these services in lockdown, um, I, I've kind of come cap, cap in hand. Uh, but um, uh, as we come towards the last uh, quarter of the year, uh, we are, are down still um, overall over the, 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 the length of the year so far. Um, with our giving and that's because we've not had church services so our regular offerings haven't been able to be collected. If you've been blessed by any of this stuff on YouTube, if God's been speaking to you um, through uh, lockdown and, and through these services, um, I just encourage you just, just to think uh, about whether you might like to make a donation to the church um, to, to support the work that we're doing, that God's doing uh, through Park Baptist Church. And if you're a regular at Park normally and you've not been able to give um, because you normally give through cash offerings, you can put an envelope, a sealed envelope through the letterbox at church, through the kitchen door uh, and, um, and just mark it with, uh, with, with, with offering or, or whatever and that will be collected and banked. If you're able to do it um, via the, uh, the, the online banking, um, details are just coming up now for our account and sort codes are. If you're able to make a, a, even a small donation, even if it's a one-off, it doesn't have to be regular giving, although, hey, if you want to make regular giving donations, then we're, we're certainly keen, um, then, then, then we'll be so blessed if you could do that um, at this time. Uh, like I say, if you're watching this for the first time, you think, oh, Plibonek, he's gone sort of full prosperity gospel. I haven't. Uh, I don't normally uh, kind of uh, use this space to, to, um, to ask, but um, just at this time, as we are coming towards the final quarter of the year, uh, and as we're looking to sort of balance the books uh, between uh, the income and towards our budget, um, uh, they're not quite balanced at the moment. So we we'd be blessed if you were able to um, uh, to make a donation if, if if you're in a position to do so. Okay, we're going to move on, and um, we're going to uh, listen uh, to the word of God being read to us. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles uh, to Ruth chapter one, and we're going to read together. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about ten years, both Marlon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your own mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you, as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And then she kissed them, and they wept aloud, and they said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again, and then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. 
Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she asked them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're starting a new series today and we're looking here at this book of Ruth. It's a story of Ruth and her mother-in-law, Naomi, and it's an unusual display of love, loyalty and compassion in the face of widowhood, poverty and displacement. It's also <coughs> excuse me, a story which subverts established racial, economic and ethnic barriers. And ultimately, it continues the royal line that leads to David and even to Jesus himself. Now, if we start just briefly by looking at where we are. We're told this story took place in the time of the Judges, which was about a 300 year period, roughly from uh, 1300 BC to 1000 BC. So we're talking just over 3000 years ago. And we read this story about a man and his family moving from Bethlehem to a place called Moab. Now what the story doesn't pick up on is the huge tension and hostility between Moab and Judah. So we have on one side of the Dead Sea, uh, Judah uh, in modern day Israel, and that's where Bethlehem was in, in, in the nation of Judah. And on the other side of the Dead Sea, in modern day Jordan, we have Moab. Now the two people groups were very suspicious of one another. Uh, there was a long and bloody history between them. So this wasn't a straightforward journey. To do this was a big deal. And we find out that it happens, it's prompted from a place of desperation. When a severe famine hits Judah. Now the consequences of this move are dire. As Naomi loses her husband and then within a decade both of her sons neither of whom have fathered any children, despite both being married. And this is, is devastating enough in any normal circumstances. But for the writer who uses this story to help us understand the bridge between the time of the judges in the Old Testament and then the coming of God's chosen king, David, it's an even more devastating turn of events because the royal line which leads to David is in threat of dying out. And so the crux of this story comes down to the fact that we have Naomi, who's left without any children and without a husband, who's almost certainly too old to conceive. And we have the threat that this royal line that leads to David and then ultimately to Jesus uh, is under serious threat of being stopped in its tracks. And so the big overarching question being asked is how can the royal line be rescued? So that's the background to what's going on here in this story. And today I want our focus to be on Naomi. And more specifically, I'd like to ask you to think about what does it mean to be empty or to be full? What does it mean to be empty or full? Naomi is emptied to the point of destitution and bitterness. I wonder what causes us to feel empty. It's a strange feeling. It's, it's that sense of purpose 
being drained away, uh, of being rudderless, that sense of loss. Uh, death is an obvious case, uh, cause, sorry, of, uh, of feeling empty. Perhaps it brings the strongest feelings of emptiness because of the devastating finality that death can bring. Like a piece of us has, has been ripped out and it leaves this gaping, open hole. Now surely that was the case for Naomi. To lose a husband is tragic. To lose a child even more so. But to lose both children and her husband, all the while living in a foreign land away from her other family, must have left her in bits. Surely she must have questioned God. Now we get very little detail of her thoughts or emotions in the passage. We just get those, those final few verses where her bitterness is on display as she lays the blame for her afflictions at God's feet. I wonder if you've had times in your life where you felt emptied. What was it that caused the emptying? When are the times where we feel defeated or are overcome? How did you respond in those times? What was your response to those events? Naomi's response is, is actually quite interesting and worth looking at in more detail. If you've got your Bibles open and you have a look at verse 6, we find that the famine in Judah has ended. And word of this reaches Naomi. So she decides to return to Bethlehem. I guess if you're going to be poor and empty, it might as well be in the familiar surroundings of home and with people that you know nearby rather than alone in a foreign land. This is a decisive move from Naomi. She takes a lead in responding to her crisis. She acts. She doesn't just bury her head in the sand. She doesn't mope about this is a brave decision for three widows to up sticks and travel alone. It's a big deal. And it becomes even braver when we find her telling uh, the two younger women to return to their own families in Moab to find peace, to find love once more. She gives her, uh, them her blessing to go and be freed from their responsibilities and obligations towards her. Naomi is taking full responsibility for the situation, even if she's still devastated and emptied by the cause of it. Let me say that again. Naomi takes responsibility for the situation she's found herself in, even though she's devastated, even though she's grieving, even though she's been emptied by the cause of her circumstances. It's possible when we encounter those times where we feel empty that we can still be wrestling with what's happened without it paralysing us from doing anything at all. A key aspect in Naomi's case is that by returning to Bethlehem, she is also returning to God. Now this might not be a joyous or singing or dancing return. She's not praising God from the rooftops. But there is comfort to be found wherever God is. Read verse 6 again to you. When she heard that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food, she prepared to return home. The news that God had provided for others is enough for Naomi to return now, there's no evidence of her feeling hopeful for herself at this point. But it's the admission that if this is what's left of my life now, I've been emptied, I've been devastated, is this is my lot, then I would rather it be near to God than far away from him. And from this decision, we have the conversations with Orpah and Ruth. Now the loyalty and the love that's shown by Ruth as she clings on to Naomi, it is startling. It refuses to condemn Naomi to complete isolation and loneliness. 
In her darkest time, Naomi still has Ruth to cling to. It's a picture of what God is like when we've been emptied of purpose. When hope has been all but extinguished. It's a surprising, passionate love, unlike anything else that we've experienced, that refuses to let us go. It's this passion and commitment to us that fuels the sacrificial actions of Jesus on the cross. So in those times of despair, let me ask you the question, how do you respond? How do you respond? Do you go further into your own Moab, your own spiritual desert, trying to run from God and maybe from anyone else who might want to help you? Do you try and bury your head in the sand, ignore or pretend that it hasn't happened? It's a dangerous tactic to employ because it's a path that often leads to unhealthy addictions and behaviours. Or do you act in a way which sees you move forward, one step at a time, even though every step hurts? Do you move towards God, even if you're angry with him? In Naomi's journey to Bethlehem, she clearly does a lot of thinking and processing. And when she arrives, she's clear in her mind that God has turned his back on her. And yet despite that, there she is, back among God's people. Something has drawn her back. Something, perhaps deep down in her subconscious, has helped her uh, take each of those painful steps back towards Bethlehem, back towards God, back towards hope. Even when that hope remains clouded and obscured. There's no quick fix when we've been emptied. There's no three-point plan. But what we learn from this opening chapter of Ruth is that identifying God and moving towards him is enough of a start to our response. Because despite how we might be feeling, God has not left us. God has not departed God is by our side, urging us to let him show a deeper love than we've ever encountered before. Our job is to take the first steps towards him. I encourage you, if you're going through that time at the moment of feeling empty, to turn towards God and take that first step Allow God to do the rest. Amen. We're going to pray together and then Jay's going to lead us as we sing a song. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we begin to digest this story of Ruth, it can bring into the forefront of our minds some painful and difficult memories and experiences. Some of those may be consigned to the history books, others, uh, those books are still very much open wide and the pain is still being felt today. Lord, May we open ourselves up to receive your love and compassion. May we not turn our backs to you, Lord. Give us courage and strength to take a first step towards you. 
And I ask that through your spirit, Lord Jesus, that you would come alongside us. Remind us of your presence. Remind us of your power to heal and start that healing within us, Lord. Lord, though we are emptied, may you fill us with your spirit that we might know with no doubt that we are loved and held by a living and loving God. Amen. So let's sing together.
I hope you have a really good week ahead. I hope it's a week where you can see God's hand at work in your life. If you're watching this live, then we're going to be on Zoom for our virtual coffee morning straight after this service on Sunday morning at half past 11. So I look forward to seeing lots of you there. But if you're not there and not able to tune in, then I pray that you will not only have a great week, but that you would be blessed and in turn be a blessing. And I'll see you next time.